So we were talking before this presentation, and Dr. Murthy was saying, so many people hear about the Surgeon General, but not a lot of people actually are truly familiar with the work of the Surgeon General. So let's get into that first. Sure. Well, first of all, I'm just very happy to be here. This has been such an inspiring experience to hear stories from so many folks. And I got to say, as I was hearing some stories earlier today about climbing sheer faces of rock and ascending to the stratosphere, part of me couldn't help but thinking maybe we should pull out a Surgeon General's warning and put it on some of those activities. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that might just be because of my fear of heights. But with that said, uh, the role of the, sur the, the Surgeon General is, is a title that's known to a lot of people, but very few people actually know what I do. Uh, a lot of folks think that I spend most of my days stamping boxes of cigarettes with labels, warning labels. But it turns out historically that the role has been primarily to communicate to the public about health-related issues. Uh, people may remember C. Everett Koop talking about HIV back in the 1980s. Uh, they may also remember uh, Luther Terry in the 1960s talking about tobacco, one of the first Surgeon Generals to do so. What I would like to do, though, is to modernize how we communicate from the office, to think about how we can use not just new technologies and platforms, but also new messages and a diversity of messengers to reach a broad spectrum of our population, spectrums which don't read the newspaper every day, don't necessarily watch TV every day, and need to get their information from other sources. And you started out in the job visiting communities all over the country to get a handle on culture and really understanding what was going on inside of, of diverse communities. What did you find along that path? Well, it was an extraordinary experience and a real privilege, I must say, because I had certainly read the reports, looked at the statistics, drawn from my own patient experiences as a physician. But I wanted to have the chance to meet with people where they were, to understand what their experiences were like and what the challenges they were facing were. And so one of the things I realized uh, along the, that trip, and, and I thought about it when we began uh, Zeitgeist, because we talked about here, the very first day, taking a giant leap forward. And what has always struck me is that if we want to take a giant leap forward, we need to be standing on firm ground. And good health is what gives us the foundation to stand on, to pursue our dreams. And the challenge that I, we are facing as a country, the challenge I saw each day when I traveled around on our listening tour, was that for many people, that foundation is not strong. But it can be stronger, because we're actually living at an extraordinary time for health, where we're covering more people than we've ever covered before, where we're making changes to how we pay for care that are driving changes in quality and lowering cost. We're also at a time where technology has made all kinds of innovations possible and advances, but also at a time where we're talking about issues that were harder for us to talk about before, like inequality mm -hmm. in health. So these give us the opportunity to do more. But when I traveled around, I heard from folks about conditions that all of you probably know of, about the challenges we have with chronic illness, like diabetes and heart disease. I heard about how prescription drug abuse is devastating communities in small towns and big cities alike. Uh, and I also heard, very concerning to me, that beyond these individual illnesses, people have lost a sense of agency. They've lost the belief that they have the power to determine whether they're healthy or not. They feel more and more that that power is in the hands of the food industry, of insurance companies, of hospitals, of folks other than themselves. And in order to create a stronger and healthier country, one of the things that we have to do is restore that sense of agency. Which, which brings up an interesting question because most of the research, most of the studies that come out these days show trust in institutions, trust in government are near all time lows. And for people in all places of this country, all over the world, restoring that trust has to be a big part of your initiative in order to get people to do the things that you hope that they will do. How do you go about doing that? Well, it's a great question. Well, one is to communicate honestly with people, but there's a second very important point here, which is that the job of creating a healthier country, the Foundation for Good Health, is not the government's job alone, and it's not a job that the government alone can execute on, but it's something that actually requires all of us uh, as citizens uh, to be a part of. And, and this is why. Like, when I look at the the challenges that are facing our country, I recognize on the one hand that we actually know scientifically how to prevent many cases of diabetes. We know how to prevent many cases of heart disease. We know how to reduce the risk of many cancers and the risk of debilitating arthritis. And that raises the question, if we know all of that, 
Why are rates of chronic disease skyrocketing over the last several decades? Why do seven out of 10 deaths, uh, are, or are they attributable to chronic disease? Why does it cost us over a trillion dollars a year in healthcare costs? And how do you answer that question? So I think the answer is that we have, is that the chronic disease is being driven really by our environment. Some people like to say, well, it's a lack of personal responsibility. People just sucked it up and exercised more and ate better. Uh, and if they're more disciplined, then we wouldn't have these problems. I think that misses actually the larger issue here, which is that our environments have changed. More and more, our environments support and drive us toward behaviors and choices uh, which are unhealthy. And we see that in infrastructure, where we live in communities which are less and less walkable. We see that in food choices, where many people live in communities where fresh fruits and vegetables are beyond their access in terms of either price or location. But we also see it in terms of culture, which are collective attitudes and beliefs, uh, which sometimes lead us toward violent behavior, which sometimes promote uh, the selection of unhealthy choices, whether it's food or around activity. If we want to change our health outcomes, we have to change our environment. And all of us have a role as community members in doing that. I think there's a saying, culture eats strategy for lunch. Yes. How do you turn the culture around, even if you have the best strategy? Well, culture is really the product of people in communities. I think it's hard for government to change culture. Uh, it's more effective when you have local leaders uh, and people of influence in communities speaking up and, cha and changing how people think. And when I, the very first city I stopped at uh, on the listening tour was Birmingham, Alabama. And I remember sitting down with a pastor in Birmingham, and uh, he had a, a large congregation. And one of the first things he told me is he said, look, we know that one of our problems is diet and that we eat too much fried chicken. So he said, what we decided in a church is that we were going to shift and get rid of all the fried chicken and instead serve baked chicken. And he said there was a lot of complaints in the beginning. <laughs> and he, even he was a little worried because he liked fried chicken. But he said over time, people got used to the, the baked chicken, that they actually not only started eating it at church, but they started baking chicken at home instead of frying it. So that one decision that the church made had, had an impact on what people were doing in, in their community. It changed uh, cultural practices. This, I think, is how we're going to change culture. It's by engaging people on the ground in changing behavior and setting examples where they live. And I would encourage us, as we, as we think about the environments that we live in, to think, what is it in our environment that promotes health? And what is it that may promote illness? And what can we do using the levers we have to change that environment so that ultimately more people have an opportunity to live a healthy life? Sometimes I think in this conversation, there's so many things that people can do to be healthier. We know we can sleep more, we can eat better, we can exercise more, and then the list starts getting so big. I'm sure there's pressure in your world to try to narrow it down and try to have one distinct message so that people really can fulfill their little checklist of I do this, I do this, I do this, and I've prevented a heart attack or whatever. What are the main things that you think people could be doing differently today that would really have dramatic impact on outcomes? It's a good question. You know, I think that there's, a, uh, there's an impetus, I think, for us to be reductive sometimes about how we think about health, to look for the one medication we could take, the one practice that we could do, the one superfood that we could eat that would take care of all our ills. Uh, and, and that's challenging because there isn't one thing. You know, I think what we saw a few decades ago was that when people started, were told that saturated fat was bad, they started eliminating saturating fat, saturated fat, but eating a lot more in the way of sodium and sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, and that had its consequences too. But there's a basic paradigm I think we can follow. And this is about creating a culture of prevention in America. It's about shifting uh, us from a country that focuses almost all of our resources on treating illness after it develops, instead to one that builds in a focus on prevention. And the way I think about it, the three core elements of a culture of prevention are good nutrition, physical activity, and emotional well-being. With good nutrition, there are some simple rules that we can follow. Trying to eat at least five servings of fruits and vegetables a day actually is an old, something we've heard for forever, but it actually is, is proven to be useful in terms of improving our health outcomes. Uh, in terms of exercise, we recently from our office put out a call to action on walking in walkable communities. And the reason we did that in part was to demonstrate that something that we have been doing for millennia, walking, uh, that just 22 minutes of brisk walking can significantly reduce your risk of heart disease and diabetes, something that many people don't know, but which could uh, literally transform their lives if they were able to incorporate that. And similarly with emotional well-being, this is an area where we actually don't pay as much attention to. 
But what the science is showing us more and more is that there are little things that we can do that take just a few minutes in our day, whether those are gratitude exercises, physical activity, spending time with friends and increasing social connectivity or mindfulness-based practices that can increase our emotional well-being and have downstream effects on not only our physical symptoms, but also on our performance in work and our performance in school. By the way, I wanted to add, if anybody is live tweeting or putting any information out there, there's, there's a funny story, actually, because apparently Surgeon General is a band. Is that it? <laughs> it's true. So, so when people uh, live tweet what Dr. Murthy is saying, it actually oftentimes um, links to this band. So what can people use as their hashtag <laughs> if, they are, if they are sharing information from this conversation? So our handle is actually Surgeon underscore General, <laughs> not Surgeon General. <laughs> I feel not bad the for the band, this. the band formerly known as. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I feel um, bad for that the band, which gets a lot of public health messages. But what are you going to? They do? probably have more followers as a result. <laughs> it's probably great for them. So, so in in narrowing it down to those those pretty simple things, I mean, these are things that we've been hearing about for years. And again, going back to that question of culture, you've been targeting also more religious communities and having conversations. Tell us about those conversations. Absolutely. Well, this is part of our, uh, our effort to engage all sectors of the community in building this culture of prevention. So recently, we've been talking to faith leaders to, to get them to engage in more conversations around mental health. One of the great challenges we have with dealing with mental illness in our country is that there is still a lot of stigma around mental illness, stigma that prevents people from coming forward and talking uh, about their condition, people, or stigma that prevents people from even getting help. And that's why, as a result, we have ha half of people in America who have mental illness uh, often don't end up getting care, uh, and that has downstream consequences for them and for the people around them. So faith leaders can be a powerful force in changing uh, how we deal, uh, how we think about mental illness, and that's why we're trying to engage them in that. But this is part of our, our larger effort uh, to say that if we're really going to build that culture of prevention, it's going to take everyone uh, to be involved. And to me, this is not just about health. Because health, to me, this is actually much more about justice. Because the pursuit of health, to me, is about the pursuit of justice. It's about the fact that every person, every child, should have an opportunity uh, to re realize their full potential in life. They should have the opportunity to start from a place where they can pursue their dreams, make contributions to the country and to the world. But many kids don't have that simply because of where they are born, because they are born in communities where they're exposed to trauma, where they're brought up in an environment that doesn't enable them to be active, where they're brought up in an environment which doesn't allow them to develop nutritious diets from the get-go. We have to change that if we want to improve health and if we want to improve well-being for the country. But this is, again, this is bigger than just health. This is, about a, this is a question of what kind of country do we want to be? Mm -hmm. What kind of world do we see ourselves as? And if we see ourselves as a country that values all life, if we see ourselves as a country that wants to unleash the creative potential of everyone, not just the people who are born in the right neighborhoods, then we have to build this culture of prevention in America and in the world. And what have you found in your short tenure so far as Surgeon General as the most effective tool in making that reality? Well, here's what I have found. I have found that people want to be a part of doing this. I have found that when I've traveled in communities, even whether it's to rich communities or poor communities, that people want to be a part of the solution. But here's the problem. They don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they're lacking support in doing that. When I, I remember after Birmingham, uh, the next city I went to when I arrived there, they, they had heard that I had been in Birmingham. They said, the first thing they asked me is they said, what did they tell you they were doing in Birmingham? And what could we learn from? because you know, we have the same problems they have in Birmingham. This hunger to understand how other communities are solving uh, their challenges with obesity, with other types of chronic illness, this hunger is deep, and people want to be a part of that solution. But right now, they don't know how to connect uh, with other people uh, who have made this a reality and addressed these problems. So that's actually one of the problems that I think technology can help us to solve. But it's not just about connecting people online. It's about creating the relationships that will allow people to have the support that they need, the guidance they need, and the community, really, that they need to make real changes in their neighborhoods. What do you see as more effective in this, the carrot or the stick? Because I think about it, that this idea of the community that you went to after Birmingham, and everybody likes a competition, or they, they like to feel like they could do something and maybe do it better. And 
How much would that help potentially in this if, if every community had its own competition to be the healthiest community in America? Well, I think competitions are great. I mean, competitions, I'll tell you, are how I got involved in counting steps. And that actually increased my, uh, my fitness level and my activity level because I started in, uh, doing a Fitbit competition at my hospital several years ago. So competitions are, you know, are, are great. Uh, but I think that here's the thing about carrots and sticks. I think that there is too much fear in how we deal with health right now in America. And fear is motivating in the short term, but it is exhausting in the long term. It is not a sustainable way to create real change in people's lives. I think what we need to do is we need to find positive ways to motivate people. There are things that people if, can achieve and have a better chance of achieving if they have good health. Many people find that Poor health stands in the way of their relationships, of them pursuing their dreams, of them, them living the lives that they want to lead, of them looking the way that they want to look. We have to be able to connect those outcomes uh, with action that people can take to improve their health and use that as a source of motivation. And this is why what's so important for us to do this is engaging people on the ground who, who message well. Uh, and message well doesn't mean that you have to have a, you know, a degree you know, in public relations or that you have to have formal training. Sometimes mothers can be the most you know, important and most effective messengers for their kids. Not always, I know like, uh, some kids are, are tough, uh, but you know, parents can be powerful messengers, faith leaders can be powerful messengers, employers, teachers. We have to find a way to harness the, the power of these messengers who are often uh, have great potential, but potential that's untapped on the ground. And if we can do that, then I think we can start to shift people toward health with positive messages. And if we do that, I think we will have a sustainable path for how to improve health in America. Your story, you, you came here at three years old, first generation American with your parents. How does that story frame what you're trying to accomplish now? We, I consider myself in, incredibly lucky. You know, my, my parents left India in the early 70s, and they came to this country because they were looking uh, for the same thing many immigrants were looking for, which is better opportunities and better education for their kids. And when they came here, they never dreamed that my sister and I would have these kind of opportunities. You know, my father grew up in a farming village. He was supposed to be a farmer growing coconuts and rice and mangoes, just as his father did. Uh, and so this was an incredible uh, turn of events for them, for me to have this opportunity to serve, for my sister to be a physician taking care of patients. And the reason that, that, that actually is something I think about a lot uh, on a day-to-day -day when I'm out in communities, because even though Wherever we come from in America, whether we got here a few years ago or a few hundred years ago, uh, people often came to this country with, with great dreams. Uh, and even if you've been here for generations, you have high hopes for your kids, the kind of hopes that my parents had for me. And one of the most painful things that I hear from parents is when they feel that they're not able to give their children the same opportunities that either they had or that they hope that they, their kids will have. Uh, and that's incredibly painful for, par for parents. And a lot of the lack of opportunity often ends up stemming from health-related issues. You know, I hear, for example, from parents all the time uh, whose, par whose kids suffer from asthma, uh, and that asthma is something that can be, asthma, as many of you know, something that can be exacerbated by poor air quality, by pollution. But asthma, uh, kids who have asthma also uh, have a greater likelihood of missing school. Uh, and as we know, missing school in the early years of life in particular can be very problematic uh, when it comes to ultimately predicting graduation rates and success later in life. So health ends up having these spillover effects. Uh, and I hear this from, from people on the ground all the time. And, and that's why I think, I think about my story a lot, because I was blessed to have parents who, even though they had very little in the way of money and didn't know many people at all when we first got to this country, uh, they made sure that my sister and I uh, had the foundations for living a healthy life. And that has paid incredible dividends for us down the line. And what do you think it was about your parents that, that helped them do that for you, that informed them? Well, I think part of it was, my father is a physician, and part of it was he, he had some knowledge about, about health as well. Uh, but part of it, honestly, was how they were raised. They were raised with diets that were, were very healthy. They were raised to be active and outside all the time. And they pushed us to do the same. They were raised with certain daily practices uh, in their life, spiritual practices, which helped ground them and give them a sense of emotional well-being, even when things were very difficult and uncertain in our lives. Uh, and, and I needed that uh, growing up, because in addition to moving to a new place where we didn't know anyone, you know, I encountered a fair amount of racism uh, when I was growing up. Uh, and as a child, I didn't always know how to process that. Uh, as a child, it made me feel uh, terrible. It made me feel unworthy. Uh, it made me feel angry at times. 
Uh, and I felt some of that, you know, uh, I re an un sort of welcome uh, memory of that come up after 9-11 when I remember um, going through the screenings, uh, you know, at airports uh, and realizing that I was pulled aside for every random screening. Uh, and it didn't seem so random. Uh, and it reminded me uh, of those difficult feelings that I had as a child, you know, where I felt like I was discriminated against, uh, feelings that I had suppressed for a long time. But I recognized that people encounter discrimination and disadvantage in many different ways in our country. Uh, and many people, you know, we would like to think that everyone begins at an even playing field, but that's simply not the case. And one of the greatest forces that forces people below that even playing field is, is poor health. And that's why if we ultimately as a country want to get to a place where we are unleashing the full potential of our people, if we want to create a nation uh, that's consistent with the values that we have, values centered around equality, around respect, around justice, then I believe that means that we have to make good health available for everyone in America, not just to those who are privileged. <laughs> Happiness is also part of your agenda. And I wonder, how do you make people happier as Surgeon General? <laughs> well, I talked about happiness a few months ago, and I was very surprised at the positive response uh, that I got. And the reason I chose to talk about it is as follows, because I realized, especially when I was on our listening tour, that many people think that happiness is something that happens to you, that it's a product of your life circumstances. Whereas in many cases, while life circumstances do uh, drive and influence our happiness, there are things that we can do proactively that can increase our level of meaning, uh, of satisfaction and fulfillment. And that in turn can have a downstream effect on our health, on our performance in school and our performance in the workplace. The reason this is so captivating to me is that we have as a country sometimes, uh, we have a tendency to think that complex problems require complex, expensive solutions. And sometimes that's true, but it's not always the case. And it turns out that some of the things that we can do, that science is showing us more and more that we can do to increase our happiness levels, are things which are cheap, which take very little time, and which are available to just about anyone. So the search and the pursuit of those kind of simple, accessible uh, techniques uh, is something that's very, very important, I think, if we want to improve health for everyone. It, this reminds me of a problem that I, I think of as the spinach and chocolate mousse problem. And here's what I mean by that. At my hospital that, that I used to work at, I remember years ago going into the cafeteria and seeing many people standing at this one particular spot in the cafeteria where on the left was a salad bar where there was a lot of spinach, first thing you saw, and on the right was the chocolate mousse station where they had all the puddings. And to me, that reflected a choice that we often force people to make between health and happiness. I find that there are restaurants which often don't want to label some of their foods as healthy because they think people will think that they don't taste very good. We have forced people to think over time or that they have to make this false choice between what is healthy for them and what will make them happy, whether it's going to the gym or sitting on the couch, whether it's the spinach or the chocolate mousse. And our ability to create a foundation of health for our country to create that culture of prevention will be in part based on how we can answer the question of how do we make healthy choices both accessible and desirable for people? If we are able to eliminate that false choice between happiness and health, if we can present people with options for, that are healthy and accessible within their reach, and if we can also market these options to them better, and I say marketing very intentionally, because I think health has a marketing problem right now. Mm -hmm. I think health is something that people see as a chore to be done, not a vision or a goal to be achieved. And unless we change that, unless we create more carrots, if you will, unless we make health something that's aspirational and achievable and within the reach of everyone in America, we won't be able to build that foundation. But the things that we have done recently, the advances that we have made, the fact that we are having more and more conversations about public health, these actually give me hope that we can get there. Uh, and especially, uh, you know, I think we'll only get there, though, with the participation of people in communities across the country. Dr. Viveth Murthy, thank you so much. Thank you very much.